Namaste and in La Catch, and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. We have a series of apocalyptic chats that peer into the depths of inner and outer realities and how we can bridge them in today's world. This week's special guest is Yvette Bethel. She is the CEO of Organizational Soul and a master at applying the laws, the natural laws, of interconnectivity, flow, and balance. She's an acclaimed author with books such as EQ Librium series and Evolve. So I'd like to welcome her and for just a moment, consider the opportunities that you'll have in listening in and applying the insights and wisdom that you'll hear today. We'll be right back. Yvette, it is so great to have you here. And with your background, this is going to be an absolutely wonderful apocalyptic chat. So thank you for sharing. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, one of the first times that I've done this. So uh, certainly I'm looking forward to it. All right. I'll promise I'll be gentle. <laughs> well, that I was not the interviewer. I interview people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, great. I love being on the other side of the mic myself and <laughs> ever get the opportunity. Yeah. Well, good. Yes. So, you know, you, you have this wonderful background and you're CEO of, of the Organizational Soul, um, board advisor, you've worked with Fortune 500 companies, you've got this um, concept and um, ability to share the natural laws of interconnectivity, flow, and balance, and which promote change more aligned with yes. who we are and our world around us. So yes. what began this? You've had to have had some early, you know, as I say in, in our interviews, you know, we're, we're looking at the bereft side of our lives, the inner side that we don't share because we are deemed as crazy, insane, weird, all those kinds of things. You know, I'm, I'm one, I wear that flag well. And so in doing that, how did you first gain access or find the, the interconnection that gave you the inkling of how interconnected things really are? Yeah, it was a, uh, a very long path. And it started, I think, back in the 90s when I you know, started figuring things out. And uh, there was this, uh, I was in, I was traveling and someone walked up to me and said, oh, we're out of the book, uh, but uh, we have some in the back. Uh, can uh, just give us a minute? And I'll get back to you. I'll, I'll bring it out for you. I had no clue what they were talking about, right? Yeah. So I just, I just went with it because I realized I, I've, I've always known to follow, you know, uh, synchronicities. Sure. And so I. And uh, that's a real gift. I, I've got to draw attention to that. That's something that we often miss. All of those things that you know we basically kind of brush them off rather than stepping in two, which is what you did. So I, I honored that. Yeah. And uh, it was a book called Conversations with God. Mm. And, you know, that, that shifted Neil Donald me. Walsh, right. Yeah. And that was way back in the 90s. And so the, 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 I've always had a connection and I've always been aware of it. And I always got in trouble for it mm. because I would speak my mind not knowing that uh, I was seeing something uh, that was a secret or that was something. Um, Apparently. Uh, right. <laughs> I, did, I didn't, you know, I didn't really have much of a clue. And uh, I got in trouble a lot for that. I figured it out eventually. Uh, what was it so... like as a kid, though? I mean, when you were first, <laughs> how did you connect with that as a kid? And what were the things that you noticed and, and spoke of that were contrary to the adults around you? Uh, I don't know if it was contrary. It was, uh, my gift is about bringing the truth into the light. 
Mm-hmm. And so uh, it wasn't contrary from that perspective, although people do view that as contrary. Uh, from an adult <laughs> perspective, yeah. I mean, they're not used yeah. to it. It's a contrary yeah. view. It's like, wait a minute, I don't want to change. <laughs> but uh, one day I walked up to my great-grandmother was uh, in the Bahamas we live with. You know, we, we spend a lot of time around family. Uh, and uh, I walked up to her and said something. And I noticed that she was doing that my mother had talked about. And so I just like blurted it. <laughs> she shouted at me. And that's the best way to put it. <laughs> she okay. really cussed. She cussed <laughs> from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. <laughs> and I had to learn my lesson <laughs> that, you know, there's some things you just don't say. Uh, and you know, it didn't go away completely, but I, I started to learn. Sure, we to learned to well. temper our voice, right? Temper, it's like, oh, yes. we got there. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really big lesson. <laughs> so uh as far as long as long as I've known, I, I can, you know, see. And what I've started to realize in the last decade or so is that I see in system. So mm. I'll see all when I see something, I'm working with clients, I see all the connections, things that uh, that are not obvious. They start to, uh, once people start talking, I start seeing. And uh, you So know, do you think that comes from a place of not just objectivity, but of a distance to where you're looking at things from a singular perspective? It could be. And how they all fit. I, yeah, I, I'm convinced that uh, that's the case because uh, certainly um, the things that I'm saying are not things that I knew before that conversation. Mm-hmm. So it has to be coming from somewhere else, uh, other or in addition to me, because I, I would sure. be the filter. Well, you you have the intent to go there to begin with because you want to serve oh, yeah, yeah. it as yeah best to your ability in that moment for whoever yeah. or whomever you're that's working great. with. And I think that's, that's this, this natural, and I'll just say love that we have it. because it's, you know, our core desire is to love and be loved. And we have yeah. covered that with so much that it's been hard to find until recently. Yeah. Maybe it's, still, uh... is, but we're, we've got some doors opening you know, with the obsession of self-hygiene and sequestration that this last event caused and got people looking. Mm -hmm. You've gotten me uh, thinking about so many things, but... uh, So let's start with the first one that popped up. (laughs) (laughs) The first thing, I'll just go with, you know, whatever comes. I think uh, connection and, uh, you know, before we, we went live, we were talking about it. I think a lot of people feel that they, or they've been conditioned to think that we're separate and we're individuals and they project individualism. And uh, in reality, we're all connected. Mm -hmm. We're all one. (laughs) The same breath of life that comes through me is the same that comes through everyone else. And And even with the... I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, for some reason, we've been, um, and, you know, I, I I don't want to talk about why I think so, but for many reasons, we've been conditioned to think that we're separate. And I think one of the outcomes of that is that we've disconnected from who we truly are. Mm-hmm. And uh, with that comes kind of a dumbing down, you know, of of what sure. we're truly capable of. Well, do you find that maybe we're a bit lazy in that and that we've accepted the, the existing systems as, as we were talking, you know, the male and female, uh, al- or alpha males and females, the top of pyramids competing with each other, even though that structure is there and there's an energy flow through it, it doesn't serve other than to create profit. Whereas yeah. the new into intelligent way of thinking about things, perhaps, is this notion like you were talking about of oneness and that systems serve the one and that in doing so, they serve all. 
as a result. But you you asked the question, are people lazy? Hmm. I I don't know that it's it's as uh, simple as that. I think it's a complex kind of a situation oh. where there's been a lot of conditioning and layering of conditioning. People have been, um, I guess, groomed to think that we are uh, supposed to get up, go to work, even if we are doing something that's not purposeful. Mm -hmm. And that takes your lights out. There's, a, there's an activity sure. that I do where it's called lights on. And I kind of follow the lights to figure out what their soul or what their spirit really wants, as opposed to them going in their heads about it. Sure. And I think the whole system puts people's lights out. And from that perspective, perhaps there's some laziness, but that's an outcome of something. I don't believe mm -hmm. human beings are lazy. I think sometimes once that evolves into apathy too, right? <laughs> of course, of course. Um, and <laughs> and they're not lazy. They are they are disconnected. Yeah. Or thinking that they're disconnected because they are detached from their purpose. They feel it in their gut, but they don't understand it in their head. Right. Right. They know something is wrong. And also they don't have uh, the words in some cases to articulate. Well, you know, I'm being mm -hmm. controlled so much that I'm not connected with myself and blah, blah, blah. Well, and our language is based on separation, fear, right? right. All those kinds of, of things that imbue life with this, oh my God, I got to be careful, right? Um, yeah. Whereas in that loving place the the oneness the loving and being loved there's a certain sense of fearlessness that comes along with that in from right. the flow and like you were talking about those synchronistic moments and the serendipitous opportunities that happen in them yeah that we did completely miss because we're not self-aware enough to pick up on it yeah i mean and it's so it's always so beautiful the way it works <laughs> you know <laughs> Indeed. Because it, it comes from anywhere. And you just have to be attuned to, you know, oh, wow, that song came on. And that's exactly what <laughs> what I've been kind of ruminating on. My wife and it's an asset. Such, we have so <laughs> much fun in noting those things. We've be, become so acutely aware of the dings and the bells and the songs and the birds and animals and cars. Yes, and yes. All these kinds of things that just imbue the conversation. Right, right. So it's a, uh, to me, it's a, uh, a beautiful mosaic, the way mm -hmm. that it works, you know, all the pieces, you don't know what's coming, but you need to be able to see them and train yourself to, to understand it. That's sometimes how uh, we're spoken to. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, speaking of being spoken to, there were some poems that were written many thousands year, of years ago called the Vedas. The Vedas, yes. And in those, paraphrase basically, as you distill it into modern terms, that we're all divine threads connected to source capable of God consciousness. Mm -hmm. Now, we knew that 15,000 years ago, or at least we were told the possibility of it. And now, with the advent of the discoveries of quantum physics, proving kind of what Neil Donald Walsh had been talking about, the conversations with God, how connected we really are yeah. to energy. Because there really is no matter now, as we understand it. It's all energy vibrating at different rates. Well, how do those rates, how do those vibratory rates acquiesce to harmony? Yeah, I think quantum physics is uh, is totally onto something. <laughs> it's too bad that it's only just uh, getting there. Well, and um, it's still data-driven. I mean, even with the discovery of the God particle, right? Yeah. They saw, they were looking for it to begin with. So the data that they got from the experiment, they said, oh, there's a decay of a particle here. So there, that must mean that there was a particle to begin with. So they said there was a particle. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I had an opportunity to talk to one of Lawrence Krauss's TAs in a science cafe here and I asked them, I said, is it possible that that subatomic explosion actually created a rip in the fabric that we have been unaware of, and it was self-repairing? Oh, really? Could the data be read that way? 
as well. Wow. And I got a deer in the headlights look. Never even considered it. <laughs> and, yet, and yet M theory and Nepi and Close have also offered some theory of everything, you know, physics models that talk about mm -hmm. this multidimensional nature that we have. Mm -hmm. So it, it just seems, you know, granted, this is, <laughs> it's not science fiction anymore. Yeah, although a lot of people still think it is uh, because of the conditioning. Sure. Well, what changes in the, have you noticed as you're delivering your exercises of connectivity? What do you- Well, notice? I've, what, what I'm noticing, it depends. Um, where I live, people aren't that interested in, uh, you know, doing well, Bahamas, the beach. There's like vacation capital, right? <laughs> I said, I, sh I shouldn't say uh, they're not interested, but uh, I think depending on the, the country, there are different um, levels of interest. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm seeing is, uh, you know, a lot of times, like uh, I, I work with a group in Italy and you know, sometimes people do, are not that uh, interested in talking about trust, but they're interested in talking about the the challenges that have something to do with trust. So it could sure. be from an, or we, I work with organizations and we're venturing into families and academia now. And uh, with, with regard to the trust, uh, they tend to want to talk about engagement or whatever the buzzwords are mm -hmm. of the day. And so what we found is we have to integrate that in um, because trust is uncomfortable uh, because it comes Absolutely. with truth. <laughs> right. Well, and you, it's a, I see it as a three-tiered thing. It, inclusive of the trust and love is faith. Yes, yes, yes. So there's, you know, it's one of those um, Trinity fractals that seem to be ubiquitous. Everywhere, everywhere you look, you're <laughs> that trifecta, right? But uh, what was I going to say? But the trust is uh, certainly something that people are uncomfortable with, and and in today's world, uh, uncomfortable is being um, pushed away, like it's being treated as wrong, <laughs> and so it's a. Uh, to answer your question, uh, it's it can be a bit difficult because it's easy to kind of shy away from the discomfort. Right. And yet all of the leadership, personal development gurus and, and all the uh, the information that's available say, you know, that uncomfortable place is the zone of change. Yes. 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 In fact, um, there's something that, that I uh, talk about in my model called change as a constant, because uh, we've been trained to think about changes as initiatives. Mm -hmm. And so we don't see what's actually going on where micro and macro changes are always going on, uh, happening within an organization. And because we're trained to see it as an event and not as a constant, uh, we don't see it. Right. <laughs> yeah, we so, don't recognize the flow right. that's taking place so that we rec can recognize the indicators right. which give us the opportunity to change a trend. Right. In the midst of it. Right. Because then if you can see it, if you can perceive it, then you can take deliberate action to do something about it. Mm -hmm. But if yeah, you're not again, perceiving what you, what it, you can measure, you can manage, right? Yeah, yeah. But the way it's being perceived is, well, we have to have a plan and make a budget. And and, and that's, there's a place for that. Uh, but certainly there's yeah, that's also a hard a place. skills. Yeah, that's the hard skills difference. of business. And, and the soft skills is what we're talking about. That's correct. Yeah. So um, the change is a constant is something that I pay attention to when I'm consulting and working with clients uh, because I can see micro changes starting to happen and people will be like, oh, nothing's happening and they're not changing, but we're not here to change personalities. We're here to change the system that the, the social interactions are cre have created and the, mm -hmm. the thinking behind it within the culture. 
So in that, I think, go ahead. Go ahead, because you were you were pausing, and I. I, <laughs> I do that. I do that, and sometimes it feels like I may be pausing a bit long, but I'm thinking. <laughs> I do the same, so I, and I recognize <laughs> that and, and apologize. So uh, please continue, and I'll try to hold that thought. I don't remember anymore. You go I ahead. I don't either. It'll, so. it'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about change and trust <laughs> and the indicators and, and the trends and, and being able to see those incremental changes in the individuals oh, that yeah. you can't see in the flow until they're on the other side of it. So how do yes, you and recognize and honor that to give the systems change more energy, I guess, or consideration, acknowledgement, honor? There's a, uh, a process that I've developed called dynamic balancing. And it has to do with identifying tensions that coexist within your family, organization, whatever. Mm -hmm. And once you identify your tensions, you identify which ones are most important to the you know, core values, to productivity, whatever. And then you deliberately take action to manage them or work with them. Because I don't believe that uh, you should control the system I believe that there needs to be enough flexibility in the system. That's what's caused the problems to begin with. We try yeah, yeah, to control yeah, yeah. everything. That's what the <laughs> therapy is, right? It's like, oh, yeah. no, I, I, I got to control everything. I have to yeah. know and do and be everything that I'm aware of. And yet it's this part of yourself that you are obviously unaware of that creates that uncomfortable zone where change can happen. When you have one there that can say, hey, have you maybe take a look at it this way, right? Or some kind of subtle prompting or encouragement or, or you know, because as you say, you can't control. All you can do is invite. Mm. Yeah, but the, the trouble is, is that we've been programmed to use controlling behaviors. So there's a whole, I, I was talking to someone the other day about unlearning. <laughs> right. Because uh, the, the programming is so deep. Sure. I, uh, there's a there's a game. Yeah, Donna Nellon has an organization called uh, Uninstitute, Unstitute, right? Instead of Institute, Unstitute, where it's the unlearning <laughs> that they're focusing on. Yeah, and I think it needs unlearning needs to be a thing uh, because uh, what I've learned is that there's a there's a simulation that I play played for like 10, 15 years with different companies. And the whole point of it is to share power. Mm -hmm. And uh, only once did they actually end up sharing the power. In fact, I had one lady start crying. She got so triggered. She started crying, saying, it's wrong to share power. This is, she actually said what they were thinking. And uh, I realized then that this, this programming is probably at the DNA level, <laughs> most likely. And uh, it, it needs, the unlearning is much deeper than, you it's know, historical, kind of culturally mental models. And yes. bloodlines and, you know, in it's, yeah. It's embedded in the DNA. Now, it doesn't yes. mean that, you know, as Bruce Lipton's proven, we can change our DNA. Absolutely. It's how we think. It's what we observe. It's what we become aware of, which allows us that opportunity to shift. But you need a certain level of self-awareness. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You have you know, to understand that your DNA is programmed. We were talking about... Um, uh, a process I took some folks through the other day and, and you know, based on that, uh, looking into their eyes and saying, I love you, our purpose is oneness. And the, initially having them look at themselves in the mirror or imagining that, there was an individual that in his 80s, a profound shift because he thought that loving himself was very narcissistic. And mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. I presented it this way and he had the chance to feel that, it was mm -hmm. profound. 
And we often yeah. think, well, this self-love, what's that about, right? It, it's narcissistic. Yeah. That's what it sounds like. But it's not. If you cannot no. love yourself, how can you expect to love another? But, uh, I don't think narcissists love themselves, so. Well, that's true, but, <laughs> that's, that's, you know, that's, but that's the kind of programming that here's yeah. a year old and, and, you know, he's a traditionalist, uh, uh, right, age yeah. wise that they're in that place. Right. Yeah. They're all about doing what needs to be done no matter what. I'm going to follow orders. I'm right. not going to question. Yeah. And I'm going to do what I'm told. Well, now, you know, several different generations later, it's like, the heck with that. <laughs> I'm going to do what I feel is necessary. And that's yeah. that core relationship of what feels right to do in the moment as opposed to the domineering effect that we've had. It also has to do with self-knowledge mm. and uh, understanding your core values and how you stack them. Because, you know, depending on the situation, you restack the priority sure. of the core values. So, um, yeah, I, I really start understand. We core value of loving and being loved. What might that look like in mm. the distribution through the systems? You know, how might that happen initially that's a good uh, question as an indicator because even with that and the ensuing discussions that take place it goes from that place generally speaking like you've just given evidence to it goes from that place to one of separative notions and having that competitive you know energy take place so we're still in an alpha mind as opposed right. to a beta mind, which understands oneness and collaboration, where the alpha mind is steeped in competition still. Yeah, I, I when I uh, started the IFB work, um, we focused uh, primarily on trust. Mm -hmm. uh, trust because it was more um, connected to organizations. But to be honest, with the family work, we're looking, we, we've integrated in love. Um, and the reason for that is that it, it would take too much to kind of dismantle a system. But when you allow trust to infuse within the system uh, where possible, because sometimes it sure. just isn't. So this isn't some... Well, you, you don't know, want to dismantle anything. You want to help no. it evolve. Yeah, right. and, and that's what spiral. Yeah. yeah, and and spiral dynamics speaks to that, where you know you're building, you're I building and evolving, dynamics. you're evolving it upward, and so, I think um, what what happens to, to go back to your point about you know how when it diffuses, mm -hmm. and how how to integrate it, um, what happens is naturally, uh, there's a. Uh, a breakdown of power. The power like breaks up and then it spreads out depending on, um, you know, it just diffuses it so that the people that were holding on to power and abusing it can no longer do that uh, for various reasons. Maybe they shifted the structure. Maybe they shifted the, the job descriptions with the structure, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, or reporting lines. But, uh, and there are other ways that... Uh, you know, that go along with other things that go along with trust, because a lot of times people believe that just doing the interpersonal work, like the coaching or the training or that type of thing is enough, but they don't understand the power of structures, right. where the structure, once there's a social system in place, uh, for example, using power, once that's in place, even if you you know, kind of coach people, it's still in place and they're still subjected sure. to that same structure. I, I had a perfect example of that in the 80s. I worked for an aerospace company and I rose to the top of the production chart. I was in charge of, of 800 part numbers, $7 million a month in shipments. And I rose just how I dealt with people. I, I lived my Midwestern values, right? How can I help you? Mm -hmm. it, it was That's where I came from. And mm -hmm. When I had a couple of supervisors come to me and ask me what I was doing, I had no idea I was at the top of the production charts. 35 people in the department. I was the youngest. And really? man, so they, they asked me what I was doing. I said, interpersonal skills. And so that gave me the impetus to push for interpersonal skills classes in our department. 
And over the next year and a half, I was able to at least get the management to consider bringing in a consultant, which they asked me to find. So I brought him mm -hmm. in, had a discussion, liked what he had to offer. And three weeks later, I was demoted. Oh. So this was the kind of corporate culture that we were up against in the 80s, where this opportunity that seemed apparent, wise, beneficial in all the ways that you can imagine in shifting behavior of a militaristically driven manufacturing That's right. environment. That's right. From a command and control to an inquiry and collaboration kind of environment, which is how I perceived it and acted as such in and proved that not only did the theory was sound, it actually worked in application. Mm -hmm. So today that's known, I believe, as emotional intelligence, which you also <laughs> get yes. much involved with. Yes, that's correct. So how do we acknowledge this sensitivity, right, that in us, both male and female, it's not gender specific. How do we acknowledge this, although it's probably more um, prevalent in the feminine gender, because um, men are taught, you know, the command and control from, the, you know, this is what we're supposed to do. Providers, right? That mentality is still there. Well, how do we, how do you use that understanding and your ability to create flow in conversations to elevate that activity, not just for the individual, but for the organization as well. Uh, I'm not sure I, I understand the question, but uh, with regard How to- it was, yeah, <laughs> let me, let me <laughs> ask simply, I guess. Um, how do you apply this new understanding in shifting the individual and organizational mentalities to incorporate this deeper level of sensitivity. That's that's such a, a deep question because it means so many things. I think some of the deep sensitivity has to do with uh, a lot of the kinds of political, social mm -hmm. things that are going on which a lot of people are uh, sensitive, maybe sometimes hypersensitive to things. Um, then uh, you have sensitivity to change and uh, the uncertainties, because now, one time ago, you know, back in the 80s or 70s, 80s when I started working, you know, everybody felt secure in their jobs. You know, you felt like, you know, mm -hmm. as long as you perform, you're fine. Yep. But that's not the case anymore. That's not the case at all. Uh, the company, you can be a top performer and, and uh, you know, be terminated. So there's there's a, a sensitivity or, a, I don't know if that's the correct word, but there's certainly a, a vigilance maybe. Mm -hmm. well, the, connotation <laughs> of that. Was, the connotation I was hoping to apply to sensitivity was more this gut feeling, right? Because we yes. all have and you're familiar, okay. I'm sure, with the three brain system of indigenous. Yes, form. the gut, the, you know, the heart, and the heart head. And the head, right. Yeah. And the processing, we, we tend to um, think and push rather than feel and respond. Um, yeah. So how do you notice that kind of sensitivity appearing in the, the folks that you work with? What are some of the indicators well, that others might recognize in themselves in our audience of the uh, possibilities that they can further explore? When I started working, um, and, and I was a like a management trainee mm -hmm. in a Fortune 500 company, and I wrote an email, and I said in that email, I feel that blah 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 blah, blah. Mm -hmm. and I said it several times in the email. And it, no, it was a letter. And so I showed it to my boss and he was like, e, 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 e. Right. not feel, Red don't feel. Yeah. <laughs> he redlined my, my whole, uh, my whole uh, letter. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Cause that's how I, that's how I bring in information. I well, feel. And that's so characteristic of an alpha male. 
Yes. But that was the attitude toward it um, back then. And I still see it. Uh, it's it, They feel that, um, in fact, I was told once that, you know, you know, you women, you don't, you, you, uh, you're so emotional. And what they don't understand is that it's, uh, it's also a gift. If you allow it, any gift, if you allow it to, you know, go one way or the other to, in, you know, in, into the spectrum, um, it can be, you know, damaging, mm -hmm. but when you're balanced with it, uh, absolutely. But they made me think it was wrong at first. <laughs> and, and yet so, one of the self-development workshops now they distinguish you know yes. first of all they say use i statements yes because we tend to say we or right, you when you want to yeah, do or something you. Yeah, exactly <laughs> when i want to <laughs> well and as you can see you know my my pronouns are i and we um so <laughs> in that process we uh we forget to take personal um responsibility and we also use the i think as, as opposed to i feel and right. in this self-development scenario it's a shift from i think to i feel because these bodies we don't even yes. realize you know they're an instrument we just haven't learned how to tune them yet alone play in concert I read somewhere that uh, when you're thinking you don't move forward. It's not creative. You just, it, oh, and, and they, they, there's, there's a, a uh, there's a, a phrase for that analysis by paralysis or whatever. So you right. literally are paralyzed. Right. Paradigm think paralysis. Too much. So um, what you need to do is go into the heart and the gut and bring it, well, the gut first and bring mm -hmm. it up. And, and that's sometimes I guess. uncomfortable as hell to begin with. Yeah, because you're been not taught, used to it. Yeah, because we've been taught not to feel. Yep. Um, what do you and, find are some of the best things that evoke that sense of feeling in a gentle, tender, non-threatening way? What evokes it? Yeah. Well, the, to be able to have the, the discussions about it. The doorway that I take as trust is building trust. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why I love trust so much because it it's not going to be immediate <laughs> and it won't work with everyone, but you can shift the collective group of people uh, in terms of how much, you know, they're willing to actually share over mm -hmm. time. Uh, if you are creating space that, that uh, allows that, and it's not that space where you're afraid to say what you think, that's not the space. It has to be a space where people can say what they think uh, respectfully because you can't just do it any kind of way because people will feel unsafe any about that well right because we're not we're not talking we're not taught how to communicate right from that place and often the curt blunt statements that come from those emotional statements are steeped with anger and frustration at someone else because of that person's bias or perspective. Yeah, and, and that can that can happen. And the thing with emotions, as you know, there, there's a contagion that happens. Um, with happiness especially, you, right? Happiness, anger, sadness. People feel you because, uh, you know, through our brains, we're connected that way. We're connected in so many ways. <laughs> Neurologically, there's a you know an empathic connection, and so you, they're going to feel it. They're going to not know why. They're going to assume it's because of them because they don't have the the information. They just feel it. Now, as a skilled facilitator in the front of the room, I tend to do this, and I, I would imagine you do too. How do you acknowledge that? sense because nobody's talking about it yet right but you can feel it how do you then acknowledge that and present a reflection of it for them to be comfortable or at least more comfortable with that acknowledgement of what's going on inside of them even though they are not able to articulate it as well sometimes it's an articulation problem uh, a lot of times that i encounter it it's also a problem of safety. 
they don't feel safe enough to say something. Because I find that when I uh, work with clients on culture and I interview people individually, they open up fully because it's anonymous. I don't sure. uh, say who said what. So it's, it's possible. They can articulate it even if they're not being clear about it. It's mm -hmm. I think what's keeping them back is this, the sense of unsafety, if right. that's a word. Well, you got to have the psychological safety and intellectual yeah. humility right. at the foundation of whatever environment that you create in order to have these discussions. But within a group, because of the dynamics of a group, and it may be that the, the manager or boss or whoever is uh, not present, but they are present because they're probably people in there that play the political game of, you know, kind of tattletaling. And so they still don't feel safe because it's just like the person is there. Sure. So sometimes it's an articulation problem. Sometimes it's uh, it's it, this it's more complex. Right. And, they, and that complexity like, includes those that are, you know, they're making comments to win points. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's so obvious to the rest of the group that they, you know, they distance themselves from that. So mm -hmm. how do you recognize that as the elephant in the room and bring it into the conversation without pointing out a specific person? The thing about not pointing out somebody is that they never think it's them. <laughs> so sometimes what I will do is... Uh, sometimes you have to be direct, right? Well, you also... It's a balance. It's always a balance. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm going to be direct with them, but not in front of everybody. I'll pull them aside and say what I need to say very directly. But in front of the group, I may not. It depends yeah. on how I sense the group. And if they would be uh, totally demoralized if I say anything at all in front of other people, because, you know, it's a competitive environment and blah, blah, blah. So I read the room and uh, determine what I'm going to say when. If if the team is uh, already very connected, then I might venture into it. Um, and, and sometimes I'm blunt <laughs> in, that, in that scenario. Mm -hmm. So um, it really depends. Everything depends on it. Everything is, to me, is situational. Sure. You have to read, read totally everything. Agree, yeah. I, uh, I experienced the same thing I did for a couple of decades. I did building road and bridge construction partnering sessions. Mm. And the construction industry is generally highly adversarial. I know. I have some clients. And so, <laughs> um, I mean, when I first stepped into the middle of the room, yeah. I was scared to death because I knew I had to get everybody on the same page and do it effectively for the benefit of the project, yeah. uh, the yeah. people, and that the people understanding the principles to get them to that place, then often are, are this these kind of conversations where I had you know a politician in one of them that really? he began pontificating, right? Yes. And so I had to gently honor his desire to speak and yet redirect <laughs> it back toward the project. So by asking the kinds of questions to get him to agree that, yeah. oh gosh, yes, I, I really didn't need to go into that and let's get back to the thing. So there's yeah. a there's a way to honor that person in the process and not call him out and make him feel uh, diminished. Yes. Yeah. I yeah, I, I know exactly what you you mean. I mean I I've, I've worked with, you know, it's I tough guess, to do. I mean it takes a lot of practice to get to that place. And you have some people that are not in the political arena, but they're still politicians and they do that. And uh, oh, it's yeah. it's uh, it's difficult to navigate, but it, it just takes experience in those cases because you can't cut them off, but you can't let them run on uh, either because they then they end up monopolizing the time. Sure. But when you're on an agenda and a time frame, Exactly. And you, got, you know, this is what you got to do. The, the, then they yeah. need to understand that. And oftentimes, um, when you do present in a way that makes sense common, right? That's the key. 
And that gives them an opportunity to step back and look at themselves from that perspective and then align with the mission of the group or the team or the company or the organization. What, what do you because mean when you say the boss. What do you mean when you say sense common? Because I've heard of when common sense. When you make sense, sense when you make right. So <laughs> it's, it's common sense, right? And and you're yeah. basically, basically you're presenting common sense from a leadership perspective. Right. Uh, you know I these know. things. Now that sense has to be made common. Mm -hmm. So as you're elucidating the or you're talking about the scenario and presenting it in a way that presents a logic train that's both intellectually and emotionally sound. Mm -hmm. It's easier yeah. to follow because it presents that gut sense of, oh, yeah, this feels right. Even yeah. though I may have wanted it to go a different direction. Yeah, what you're describing is uh, balancing a dynamic balancing uh, process where you're balancing what you're saying, you're balancing your emotions, you're balancing what you're projecting so that you can watch the balance in the room. Uh, so it's uh, quite a dynamic uh, projection. It ta that takes uh, quite a lot of uh, skill <laughs> to, to pull that off. Thank a you. lot of people... A lot of people are not air, uh, able to do that. And I think the next level up is having a split mind where you can, um, you know, think about what it is that the person's saying and saying at the same time. Um, and, and you get this through interviewing like this, mm -hmm. where you can split your mind. Uh, but that's a, an added feature that you can right. add to that, well, and, that and process. We're kind of like we're tesseracts in that way, right? Mm -hmm. We're throwing stuff out in the future and then embracing it as it comes back to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a phenomenal process. Now, in this, what have you found that is a, a, a salient point, if you will, that brings people into that willingness mm -hmm. to be present without attachment to outcome? The, there's a process. Uh, that I developed. Um, it's called "Say Yes to Me," uh, and yes. it's really a, it's really about uh, building your confidence. Uh, because uh, a lot of times when people, I think some people conflate trust and safe space, so they believe it's the same thing. <laughs> and uh, I, yeah, I've been told that multiple times. And so if if we can get people to to be confident, even when they feel there they may or may not be a threat, mm -hmm. uh, that's when uh, the, the state that you've described can, can happen. But before that, they're going to remain uh, closed off. Although there are some people that trust regardless. They, they're just open. I call them trust optimists. You know, they're optimistic. They're, everything's I've good. been called the eternal optimist because I always see a silver lining in anything. <laughs> uh, and there are you just yeah. have to look yeah right? i i now, think what, uh, speaking of looking i, I want to go back to sensing I, for a moment how do you recognize that gut sense what's it feel like when things are um needing to change because hmm. we often don't you know it's like we we might feel things in our gut and in, in intuition. You know, I often use the the example of feeling anxious and what that feels like in your gut. And it's a choice to be anxious. There, there's a, a hinge point there. You, it's the same sensation. You can take it one way and feel anxious. You can take it another way and feel anticipation. Mm -hmm. One yes, uh, also the fear-based yeah. side, the other the trust side. And sometimes it's a, a combination of both. Uh, it's fear and because from what I gather, sure, fear absolutely. and excitement and anticipation feel there's a similar feeling. Um, although I'm sure there's some nuanced differences, 
Mm -hmm. But uh, I think. Uh, well, how would you determine feeling that sensation? Then how would you filter it through the second and third brains to you know, be able to do something with it? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what I what I did when I left my job. Because <laughs> okay. I think it, I went through that that whole um, process, but to me it uh, it started more in my heart uh, because I felt like uh, there was a purpose that I wasn't living up to. Mm. Um, and then I think it went into my my gut because I didn't act on it. I, I I had the knowing, but I didn't act. And so it went into my gut. And that's when the uh, anticipation, the anxiety, it was a, a unsettled feeling. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know what to do because I was like, this this feeling wouldn't go away. It but sat with me. If you did know what to do, what might have come up? Well, I'll tell you what I ended up doing. Okay. Um, I said, well, let me just write a letter of resignation. <laughs> <That's>, right? <yes. laughs> and I, I didn't really intend to submit it. But I said, let me write it and see if this feeling will go away. And I wrote it. And it disappeared. Why and do you think couple, that happened? Because it was supposed to happen. <laughs> I was supposed to submit it, but let me tell you what else happened. So after well, that. But the fact that you let it go, you put it from, you, you took it out from inside, you put it in black and white, and that created a momentum. That simple. No, but I, I, I refused to do it. And so the feeling came back in my gut. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Seems like I have to handle it. Now what do I do? Huh? <laughs> yeah, now I wasn't ready. I hadn't planned. I, you know, I, I was going to lose, you know, my income. That's when the real panic set in. And then I had to sit with it and then release it. And that when I released it to uh, the executive with responsibility, um, that's when I found peace again. Even though in my head, I didn't have peace because it didn't make sense. I'm a planner. I'm always, you know, I have, I have these sure. laid out plans, 10, 20 pages. And uh, I walked away with nothing. <laughs> yeah, I can Most tell you people... how many times I've done that in my life. <laughs> right? And you have to. This is how you learn to follow your gut, right? To follow yeah, yeah. the flow. And yeah. You know, when you first experience, man, it scares the bejeebers out of you because you don't know what to expect. Yeah, yeah. And then as you get comfortable with that process. Right. Because it is a process that, that there's a whole sensory array and uh, extrapolation of, of doing that comes from that that you get comfortable with over time when you begin to recognize, oh, okay, here's, I'm feeling like, ah, all right, there's a beginning of an end here just because of that gut feeling of there's that disconnection that's taking place and the, the quandary that you have of, oh, this doesn't feel right anymore. Yeah. The first trouble is, is not going to make it feel right. Yeah. But then it's the allowing it just to feel like it is and then figuring out what to do from that place rather than trying to control it yeah and, and back to your original question where you were asking about people in, in the workplace that you know kind of experience this mm -hmm. i find that a lot of them ignore it because they need the income safety and security yeah so the the lower level uh needs in the hierarchy hold them you know in kind of a, a bondage sure and it creates stress, which creates disease. That's right. And then they wonder why they get sick. Yeah. We That's, all do, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and this is what For happens. many reasons. <laughs> yeah. But the stress doesn't help at all. Yeah. No, not at all. And then there's also the, the other ancillary 
thoughts that we hold that we really never let out that are so constricted internally with fear that mm -hmm. it causes a manifestation of various body dysfunctions. Yes. Uh, whether right. it be cancer or multiple sclerosis or, you know, Diabetes. Parkinson's or yeah. any yeah. of those kinds of things. I think that, and I could be wrong and I, this may be insane, However, I think if we, when we get the opportunity to have the technology to, and understanding to trace those things back to the original, you know, um, Hippocratic Oath and, and medicine, it comes from the spine, right? The thinking, this is that central nervous system that manages our entire body and it's how we feed it that produces the results. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think different doctors have different That's a types of doctors. View and, and yet it seems to be um, consistent, mm -hmm. especially with the ancient philosophies. Yes. And the thing about the Vedas, you know, that we're all these divine threads connected to source capable of God, God consciousness. Well, that simply means that we have access to infinite intelligence specific to us because of the mm -hmm. questions that we ask and the answers that we receive it can be applied to nobody else but us because that's the connection we have now if it happens to spill out because of, of the role we're playing in the world yeah, i was just better. gonna say if, if, if we're if you are being purpose driven it will spill Mm -hmm. uh, because if it's specific to you um, and we're here to serve, then it has to spill up. It does. And, and speaking of, and you mentioned spiral dynamics earlier and, you know, planetarycitizens.net, which is an effort that I've created to explode the co-creation wheel into its various, various sectors, what's available in each, what people can do, the pioneers in each. And it's all from the spiral dynamics model that really? elevates the consciousness to this place of understanding oneness and being able to operate in that. Now, we're far from that currently. However, we saw how quickly the world can change just a couple of three years ago. Four yeah, years yeah. now. So but if we've got that example that within a matter of, you know, a few weeks, the entire world can go on lockdown, what can, what positive things might happen should we choose? You know, I think with, when we talk about elevating, a lot of times people don't realize, and I come across this a lot with culture work, they don't realize that when you're elevating and, and becoming more, tr meaning you're becoming true to your core values, your espoused ones, uh, as one part of the definition. I know sure. it's way more than that. Um, but when you're elevating, there are going to be um, aspects of the old culture that will coexist. It, it just won't dominate, but it'll still be present. And it, a lot it, of times... the evolution. Yeah. Part, but, right? We but, can't deny what is. However, we can assist it to move on right but the trouble is when when you're in the midst of it it looks like it's not changing because mm -hmm. they're still seeing what they've always seen because they've been that's what it is and and they've been Old eyes. to see that that's it and they don't see what is changing they can't see it and so they they take the position that nothing's changing we're doing all of this and nothing's changing and it is changing. And for them, that belief is true. Because uh, they're going by what they see, but they don't right. see the, mi the micro changes. Yeah. The micro changes are the constant. So uh, it's important to start to recognize that evolution inc is inclusive. <laughs> it doesn't reject something. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we, you know, we're one planet, we're one people, we have, you know, various individuations of such, and yet we're not anywhere else. We're sharing this wonderful world. We just mm -hmm. have been growing in our 
capacity to share mm -hmm. because in the past it's been the dominance and control uh, power money resources um, those that feel that they've got the best interests of others in mind from a controlling perspective don't necessarily see that it is the out of control side of things that they need to be paying attention to and nurturing <laughs> those to self-manage. That makes sense. I was going to ask you, what do you mean by that? Because so, I think some of the out of control things may just be informational. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's the, it's a discernment capacity that we have that mm -hmm. we're building right to mm -hmm. what feels congruent what feels harmonious what was the resonance mm -hmm. in it and this is all frequency based because this is what quantum physics is revealing our reality is frequency based it's all vibrations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now that sounds really goofy to uh, you know me. to some because we aren't equipped to think about things at that level because our education systems haven't given us that yet. They're focused on learning, repeating, regurgitating, testing, not necessarily how or what we learn in the way that promotes a unification as opposed to the separative events that we've had in our past. So how does this in that self-management is what I'm alluding that internally from that place of being cosmic consciousness condensed into form, unaware, there's that core part of us that is aware, connected, and operating in full functionality, even though we don't see it yet because we haven't developed the awareness to get there. There is this innate holistic design that we are made in to naturally fit with each other. Yes, I believe that. This is that love and being loved place where yeah. there's total freedom for that to take place because there's unconditional aspects of it that simply allow others to be themselves and encourage this deeper, uh, for lack of better, um, this more intimate understanding of the operational self with a big S. Hmm. Now, how does that reflect in the work that you're doing? And because and, it seems to, to me, I, I mean, we're speaking the same languages. We're speaking the same thing with different languages, right? Even though yeah. it's English. Um, <laughs> that's why i keep asking you okay what do you mean <laughs> right. and then and, i and say oh that means that. this isn't this yeah you know because we're, we're both educators and we know that there are different levels that we listen to and the audience is in those different places so we need to be able to speak to those effectively otherwise yes. we miss the ability to communicate appropriately and i mean you make a, an important point right at the end um because the language has to even though the, the thinking uh, may not resonate, at the very least, the language needs to get through mm -hmm. um, the barriers. And so it's important to, I think through quantum physics, you adjust <laughs> the frequency of the message um, so that they can receive it. And it's not that, you know, it's better than or worse than, it's just different. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, and, it's and, when you're working with a construction group, um, a city council, yeah, uh, yeah. a company, you know, a very organization. Every one of those are going to have a different listening place. Right. I mean, I've worked with construction groups and, you know, they use profanity, every other word. Then you work in, you know, some places and no one's saying anything. And yeah. then somewhere else they won't stop talking. So yeah. it's... It's it's so different wherever you go. You just have to uh, make the shift uh, within yourself because you're the facilitator. As a facilitator, 
you I, I would have to shift or whoever's facilitating oh, yeah. me makes you, go, you walk in you read the room and you adjust accordingly mm -hmm. and that's I, part of the gift that we develop i think it's a natural one to begin with or at least it seems that way for me because i as i developed my own skill i thought well gosh if i'm doing this everybody ought to be able to <laughs> not the case um yeah. and you know when you get somebody that uh, that watches it that's not part of it and then mm -hmm. reflects back gosh i don't know how you do that Right. It's it's not easy because you're also picking up emotions. Sure. Um, I uh, I was with a, a client once, and he thought I said something. Uh, I think there was a word I used that caused him to go into it was a, some kind of a personal spiral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a trigger. And right? yeah, but it had nothing to do with what he perceived. And uh, usually doesn't just, does it? Well. It was, I was like standing there like a deer in the headlights because I was shocked because I couldn't figure out what was going on because <laughs> what I said had no, I right. didn't see the, the connection. Like, where did that come it, from? But certainly uh, it triggered him. And so I had to allow a little bit. And then because he was so triggered that there was no explaining. So when he calmed down, we had a conversation and then he said, oh, I thought you said something else. <laughs> Never Again, apologize. It's in the but, hearing. It's how people yeah. listen, and you got to be yeah. really careful with that. But uh, you have to sense. But you have to sense if what what their worldview is in order for them to hear you, <laughs> and and in order for you to to share uh, in a way that they can understand. And I think there was a mismatch there. Sure, sure. So we, we're. Gosh, this has been wonderful. I, I, time has just flown by. Oh wow! Um, yeah, I I, <laughs> I didn't realize that. So you have been just amazing in, in how you've expressed and, and related this very important uh, aspect of living and working and being in the world. Uh, thank you so much for your time and and your insight and wisdom shared today. Mm -hmm. You what, know, I thought, what, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, um, what can you offer as a parting gift that folks can take away and apply on a daily basis in their own lives? I was, I was just going to say this. <laughs> I think when I, when I thought about, you know, joining you on the podcast, Apocalyptic Chats, I thought about okay, what is it that people, what is it that people need to know, and uh, I think one thing to remember is that we need to wake up to what's what's changing. We feel it, we know it, but systemically, what is changing, and uh, we need to wake up to the micro changes that are happening, so that there's no. Um, this reactive kind of, um, you know, action that happens when you figure out, oh my goodness, this is this is something different, and uh, I don't know how we got here. There's always there are always clues. You can always follow the breadcrumbs. So I think in in my parting words would be, you know, connect with each other, connect with the, the organization. And learn to trust. Trust is at the key, the core of it. You may not love each other. <laughs> that, that's okay, because, you know, you kind of can't. You're not choosing who you're working with. But certainly um, tr learn to trust to the extent that you can. You may trust some things about a person and not other things, and that's fine. Uh, but bring trust in so that you can have some level of uh, safety and comfort for yourself to begin with. And, and and you can build your confidence because a lot of times we don't understand how trust builds breakthroughs in our own lives. Uh, and in, in connecting and deepening connections where possible, because I, I don't believe all connections uh, you know, are going to deepen, but where possible so that you can um, really take your experience and your contribution and your development 
uh, to the next level because the world needs to come together. Um, it's it, it the separation is uh, it's outdated and it's not real. What's real is that we're connected. Very good. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Vet, and <laughs> really appreciate your time. I appreciate yours too. Thank you very much for inviting You're me. You're very welcome. And <laughs> namaste and in lock catch. And thanks for sticking with us for this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and I will see you next time. <laughs>